welcome back everybody so happy thursday and we have an oldie but a goodie this was actually the first competitive deck that i played in set two when i really started to get into lurkana at the end of last year um and we're gonna run it on back so our subscriber count is going through the roof but still like 85 percent of our views come from unsubscribed people guys hit that button it's not all in vain we are giving away a case of set five when we hit 4,000 subscribers i know we can do it quick because we gained like 30 yesterday alone so thank you guys for all of the support other ways to help the channel are linked down below but without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into and go over the deck list. Amber, Amethyst, Hyper, Aggro. Is the deck still viable? Well, it got top 8 at a 94 person tournament. And that to me means that the deck is still viable. It's a deck that obviously you try to jump out very early, very, very quickly. And just put your opponent behind. Make them react to every card you're playing. And then you win in that sense. So I was messing around with it. Uh, you can see kind of the some of the statistics on the deck there. Uh, $119. So it's a pretty budget deck overall. Nothing above a 5 cost card. So our cost curve is relatively cheap. 13 uninkables. So there's not too many times where you're going to get clogged up with uninkable cards. But do keep in mind that it can happen. Some other things you might want to wonder about. So... I said in the other video, you need to have one good matchup versus the top four decks being Sapphire Steel, Ruby Amethyst, Ruby Sapphire, and Bucky Discard. I think this deck has an incredible Sapphire Ruby matchup, and right there's your good matchup. Otherwise, what are your matchups going to be? Um, I mean, the Steel ones have the songs, so naturally they're going to be potentially harder. But if you're on the play... I think this deck can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any deck in the game right now. I just don't think that decks can answer it quick enough. Uh, Steel Song would probably be the biggest counter to this deck, being the fact that they can grab your swords anytime after turn two if they have the right opening. So that is just very, very difficult to deal with. And if they have it, they kind of just have it. Uh, we do have a counter for that in there in the Bare Necessities, which we'll get to in a little while. So our one-drop spots... Um, also, like Sapphire Steel, um, if you can prevent them from getting to grab your swords, you win that matchup pretty handily. Uh, Bucky Discard, you can you have a lot of low-cost characters. You can usually spam your board and go wide before they can get to their cards needed um, to empty your hand. So you kind of empty your hand for them. Um, so you kind of naturally can play a little bit around Bucky Discard. And then using your bodyguards to force them into weird situations. Again, it comes down to if they have the right songs at the right times for how that matchup will play out. But like I said, Ruby Sapphire, pretty favorable. Uh, Ruby Amethyst, I think you have a pretty favorable matchup there as well. Um, not quite as good as Ruby Sapphire because they do have a little bit more early presence. But again, a lot of the time, you're winning by turn 5. Sometimes by turn 4 you can win. So like versus ruby amethyst you take more often than not you take things like lady tremaine madame medusa and be prepared right off the table because you just win before you even get to that point so if you can win before those power cards come down which again is not that hard you're going to be sitting in a pretty good spot um, fox and maui obviously being the biggest threats to you because they have rush and well they're going to take out your bodyguards we were playing two Cinderella's because we are playing the friends on the other side and the bare necessities. So we're playing eight songs. She can sing them both on turn two, which is just free value. I didn't want to overcommit to Cinderella though, because realistically we're playing aggro. You want to go aggro. You want to get out things like your Lilo or your Maleficent on turn one. They are one ones and they do quest for two. They are uninkable. So that's eight of our 13 uninkable cards. Um, I really like both these cards. Like They're essentially the same card, but different colors. Like I said, 1-1s, one quest for 2, but you can just get them out early, and they're going to put in their work. They're going to do their thing. We play a lot of low-cost characters, so on turn 2, you have Piglet Pirate Pooh, or Pooh Pirate Captain, um, and obviously it's a 2-2. If you have two other characters on board, this card can quest for 3. 
So essentially you go like turn one, Lilo and Maleficent, turn two, Piglet, turn three, ideally you're going to go Bodyguard on turn three, and then you're, you have three characters, so your Piglet's going to quest for three, you'll quest for two from your Lilo, so turn two you get two, turn three you quest for five more up to seven, and then you're going to drop another card, and then like I said, by turn five usually you're curving out to win the game. We're playing four Simbas. It's a two-cost bodyguard. You're, you know, you want to get them bodyguards down early, and get them to protect your cards. Wendy, darling, three willpower, two quester, inkable. That's all I need to say about it. She survives a lot of the song hits. She sticks around and takes multiple cards to remove her. So that's why I do really like Wendy in this deck. I was on the fence on it if we wanted to play it or not. The Madam Mim Snake. Ultimately, Snake stayed in here for the Goat Bounce play. He's That's pretty much why it's here, for a Goat Bounce. Um, hint, hint, we are playing Goat. Additionally, though, you can like go Lilo or Maleficent turn one, and if you need to come down with like a Snake turn two, bounce it, and then you can replay it at a later turn, or even like turn three, turn four, you can say Quest Lilo, Snake bounce it, then you replay the Lilo in that same turn just so now it's in a readied state and your opponent cannot challenge it if you don't have a bodyguard another thing you can say do is cinderella turn one sing friends on two play your snake bounce that cinderella back to your hand and then you can just use it as free ink fodder for the following turn pinocchio star attraction it's another one one uninkable but it's two ink and he quests for three so we have lilo maleficent and wendy who all quest for two those 11 cards. Piglet, who quests for one, but usually is going to quest for three. Pinocchio, who quests for three. Three Pinocchio, by the way. And that rounds out our two drops. Getting into our threes. Donald Duck, the new bodyguard Donald Duck. This card is incredible if you play it on three. Because let's say you curve, you go like, I guess, either of your one drops. And then on turn two, you go Pinocchio or Piglet even. Then you play Donald Duck, you play him exerted because he's a bodyguard, and that's what you do. And you get to pick a character who gets plus one lore this turn. That means all of a sudden your Piglet, your Pinocchio, they're questing for four lore this turn. So you go two on turn two, and then you're going to be questing for two more from your Maleficent or Lilo, plus four from that Pinocchio or Piglet when you play your Donald Duck. Blue is kind of nice because it does offer that two lore when he gets removed, but his zero strength just doesn't do enough to your opponent. It doesn't slow them down. They just take him out. You get the two lore, sure, but Donald Duck is inkable, has two strength, and gets you one of those two lore anyway. So it's only a one lore difference between the two, but he has two strength and is inkable. So I think Donald Duck is far better than Baloo. Prince Eric being another bodyguard that we opted to play. I like the 12 bodyguards. I like to have that bodyguard play on turn 3, whether it's Simba, Donald Duck, Prince Eric. To me, Donald Duck's the number one bodyguard in the deck, then Prince Eric, then Simba. Simba is just a cost cheaper than your Prince Eric. However, the 3 strength of Eric means something like a Madame Mim Fox trades into it evenly. Fox will survive the Donald Duck. Fox will survive the Simba. And heaven forbid they have like a snake, they bounce the fox, then they replay the fox and has no damage on it once again. It just puts you in a bad spot. So Prince Eric having the 3 strength is actually very important for your bodyguard because it helps deal with a lot of characters. Something that I had played in this deck in the past, and he finally makes his way back in here. And in my personal opinion, I've heard people say they don't like it. Arthur, Wizard's Apprentice, his Enchanted is arguably my favorite Enchanted art in the game. Definitely right up there. But anyway, he quests, you can bounce a card back to your hand, and you gain two lore. So the big play with Arthur is you play Arthur on three, and then on four, you play your goat, you get one lore. You quest with your Arthur, you get a second lore. Arthur then bounces goat, you get third and fourth lore. Goat triggers, you get a fifth lore. And then assuming you have a bodyguard, they can't do anything to your Arthur, turn five. Guess what do you do? Goat, Arthur, bounce goat, five lore once again. It's a loop that provides or proves to be very, very effective. Bouncing goat is important bouncing and sometimes dealing with your opponent's boards also very effective so madam mim fox is going to be a four of 
Just this card is just really, really strong. Almost every Amethyst list is going to be playing Madame Mim Fox, and there's a reason for that because she is just so good in this game. The last two characters we have are those four goats because, again, the free lore is just very, very strong. And then four Kita Protector of Atlantis. I know there's the one cost Kita, and you can shift on three. Shifting on three is pointless. By turn three, you have what? And especially if you shift, that means Kita is one of them. You're protecting one character. I'd rather come down with a bodyguard every single time. There's no reason to shift Kita on three. However, you could shift Kita on five and still save those two extra, um, those two extra uh, ink to be able to play a second card. So I get that argument. However, to me, if you get to turn five and you need it, I'm just fine hard casting Kita. So essentially, you quest, and by turn five, you're probably questing for like five to eight in that turn alone, and then you play your Kita, and unless they have a character with Rush or some type of board wipe in their hand, they're not trading board whatsoever because everything on the board just lost three strength, and odds are they're not going to be able to deal with your character. So she kind of acts as a bodyguard against the entire board, again, unless they have a Rush character or some type of board wipe in their hand. And if you quested for five that turn, she quests for two, so you're going to have seven on board for the following turn. The only thing I will say is keep, keep, keep in mind with Kita. If for some reason you get into a grindy game versus a ruby deck, or if they have a Sisu on board and they were on the play, I would probably not play my Kita unless all my characters have one strength anyway, because then a shift Kita or a shift Sisu is going to wipe them regardless. But if you have any characters with more strength on board and you want them to last, don't play your Kita because the minus three to everything means that shift Sisu will board wipe it all. But again, once again, pretty much everything, like your Pinocchio, your Wendy, your Piglet, your Lilo, your Maleficent, all is going to die to that Sisu anyway. I just know if I don't mention it, someone's going to bring it up in the comments down below. We have those four bare necessities. Use this card sparingly and effectively and try to mulligan for this card if you're going up against a Steel Song for sure. Probably Sapphire Steel versus Emerald Steel. I don't know that I necessarily would because if you can get them to just start playing their songs as opposed to playing their discard engine, the trades aren't too bad. So bare necessities, you for sure want to try to mulligan for this against Sapphire Ruby and or not sapphire ruby um steel song and like other steel variants like sapphire steel uh to be able to hit that grab or, yeah they grab your swords because that card is just so detrimental to this deck uh friends on the other side also just a four of drawing two really good queen's castle also this card is just so good like a lot of decks can't deal with it in a single turn so you're guaranteed a couple lore and if you play it like after turn four where you have lore to move there you can just obviously play this card move characters there and all of a sudden you're drawing more you're restocking your hand you're getting potentially two turns out of it so that's two to four possibly six lore by the time they get rid of castle on its own too it's just a pretty good top deck to throw down and if they're in a spot where they can just crash into it with a bunch of characters and remove it you're probably in a bad spot that game to begin with so I cut out some of the other visuals from the last um, deck profile we did. I don't know how I necessarily felt about them. I felt, was like, you know what, we can just make it clean, just go right on Dreamborn, talk about the cards, and kind of what works with what, go over some matchups like we did. Uh, but yeah, so essentially, like I said, your turn one, Lilo or Maleficent are what you really want to go for. Cinderella is just there to be able to play your songs on turn two. Um, so like versus Steel Song especially, like I would go Cinderella early um, and then you can like Bare Necessities, uh, it, I guess depends too, if you're on the draw, probably Cinderella, not your Lilo or Maleficent, if you're on the play, probably go with your aggro card, come back with this on like two, and then on three you can sing the Bare Necessities to see their hand because they're not going to be anywhere where they can... Um, really damage you too bad like they're not going to use a grab your swords on one character so you don't have to worry about it at that point 
um, what other things to pair up really well. Like I said, turn two, you don't necessarily want to come down with your Simba. We just wanted three bodyguard characters. Uh, and if you don't have like Piglet or Pinocchio or Wendy, then don't play your Simba. Another common thing I have seen a lot of people do in this deck is like they'll come down with Maleficent on one, quest with it on turn two, play a Pinocchio, and they just say, well, he's just going to get rid of my Maleficent, but I got two lore out of it. Don't do that. Like if you have a bodyguard, especially one of your three drop bodyguards on board, you can leave your Maleficent and just don't quest with it on turn two. Because then when you put that bodyguard down, if it they don't clear in one turn, now all of a sudden that Maleficent, instead of two, it just got you four. So do keep that in mind too. You don't have to quest with things right away. You can wait a turn to make sure that you get a bodyguard down, you get a bouncer to hand, you get that fox, you get a way to protect what you have. And then again, Kita is just so good in this deck. Super underrated. I don't see her in enough of these lists. But... This is my take on the deck. Um, I really like it. I think it's a ton of fun, and I can't wait to continue playing this deck moving forward. Thank you guys for watching, and until next time, like, share, subscribe, comment down below. Take care.